The recent arrest of a young Indian climate activist by the name Disha Ravi caused quite an uproar. She was apparently arrested for her alleged involvement in an online toolkit related to Greta Thunberg and the ongoing Indian farmer protest. While the arrest was, as expected, it was widely criticized by the international press, there were some people online who were continuing to mount allegations against her and were defending the seditious charges that were leveled against her. We are not going to discuss about the farmer's protest or Disha's case in particular or anything that has to do with politics, but there was some something else, there was some detail about her that was widely circulated online that apparently should not matter, but some people think that it matters. Here it is. Now, fact-checking news websites were quick to respond and debunk this claim. She was apparently not a Christian, but what if she really were? And in this context, the Indian politician and prolific author Shashi Tharoor penned a piece in The Week. He makes a brilliant case for the role that Christianity has played in India and he uh, you know, exposes the Hindutva propaganda against Christians. Now remember, Tharoor is a practicing, he's a devout Hindu and he's the author of books like Why I Am a Hindu. Now he pens this piece where he uh, goes one by one through some of the achievements that Christianity has brought to India. We'll go through the piece. So Tarur begins like this. During the unpleasantness surrounding the arrest of, of the 22-year-old activist Disha Ravi, the most unsavory of the many disagreeable elements in the controversy was the attempt by Hindutva social media warriors to disparage her by claiming that she is Christian. She is not. But what if she were? In the BJP's new India, is merely being Christian enough to qualify for the epithet anti-national? This question is right on the money. If you just take a couple of cases in the recent past, be it NDTV's Pranay Roy or the activist and journalist who was shot dead, Gauri Lankesh, or the outgoing Supreme Court Justice R. Banumati, all of these people were just labeled as Christians and the implicit narrative here is that if you can just show that a person is Christian then that person is also by default uh, you know has some foreign vested interest against the country and therefore you can discredit that person now the architect of the Indian Constitution B.R. Ambedkar had actually foreseen this danger when decades ago he wrote this he said I see great dangers for Indian Christians ahead goes on to say they have to reckon with militant Hinduism masquerading as Indian nationalism. Why are we always pushed to show or, you know, to display our loyalty to the country? I share the very sentiment and the statement of an Indian Christian who wrote to Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, whom we call Mahatma Gandhi, uh, regarding his uh, publication called Young India, which was a weekly paper that ran from 1919 to about 1931, which was published by Gandhi. And in that paper, it was always, you know, it used to talk about Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, but Indian Christians were seldom involved uh, in any of its, uh, you know, articles and its publications. And therefore, this Indian Christian writes to MK Gandhi, and this is what he says, I should like you to believe that we Indian Christians are also people of India and take much interest in India's own affairs. Tarur goes on. The irony is that Christians have long been the builders of modern India. I repeat that. Christians have long been the builders of modern India. This is an undisputed fact. You know, I can say this without apology, that if Christianity had not come to India, India would have been a very, very different country. I'm not saying that every good that we see in India is, you know, uh, something that, that has come as a result of Christianity. Obviously, there has been movements like Jainism, Buddhism and all that have predated Christianity and, you know, they were all anti-caste movements. They did social reform. All of that happened. But Christianity was the big push 
forward uh, towards modernization in, in India. Just go about 100 or 200 years uh, back and you will see that in India you had practices like temple prostitution, uh, Devdasi culture. It was the work of the missionary a Amy Carmichael that actually brought changes there. Uh, you had practices like Sati where a widowed woman had to jump into the pyre of her husband just 100 years back and to give her life. It was the Christian it was the work of Christian missionaries that changed that. Uh, you had practices like infanticide, child marriage. What about the infamous breast tax in Kerala? Which again, it was the work of the missionaries that actually brought structural changes in the society, modernized India and secularized India to the modern India that we uh, see today. Therefore, it was definitely the work that Christianity did across the social sector, the educational sector and the healthcare sector that transformed India. And one of the main ways in which Christianity changed India was by education and that's what Tarur gets into next when he says that even BJP leaders like LK Adwani had their intellect first shaped by Christian education. Then Tarur goes on and you know speaks about himself how he uh, was exposed to Christian education right from a young age and how it helped him and then he finally makes this comment. He says, I should mention that the three schools I went to from ages 6 to 16 had an interesting detail in common. They were all Catholic schools, two of them Jesuit. It is remarkable, notice this, it is remarkable how much this one order has done to educate and train millions of Indian children to make successes in their lives. Literally millions of children. You know, the legacy of Christian education in, in India is quite deep. Missionaries, when they came to India, remember the caste system was uh, something that was well rooted in the Indian society. Only a few castes or the upper caste they, they, they had access to education. It was in that context that mi missionaries democratized uh, education and education was given to the tribals, the lowest rung of the society. Everyone, girl, boy, everyone could come and access education. And that was, and if you, today we say that education is the chief defense of the country. It was Christianity that set up the defense. And just think about this. And I, there's a humorous side to this as well, that Consider the schools that around you. You'll have the Don Bosco schools, the St. Francis, the St. Xavier's, the St. Mary. But here's an interesting detail. Even private schools that are not necessarily run by the church or by Christians do have, uh, you know, names, Christian names that are given to them. There was a recent article in the scroll which was titled Mistaken Identity why private schools in India love to name themselves after Christian saints. And there's an interesting comment that the article makes about middle class Indians, which is apparently true. It says, getting an English medium convent education has long been a goal for middle class Indians. So private schools named on the lines of Christian schools can be seen as an acknowledgement of the success of church run institutes. Now Tarur actually goes on to share a small detail about one of his class teachers. He says the late father Remedios, a superb guide to Shakespeare as well as values of life, was an excellent class teacher who, after instilling in us his profound knowledge of Julius Caesar, cycled regularly to the jail, visiting prisoners to minister to their moral and spiritual needs. I think that's a beautiful comment coming from Tarur because in our day, you know, some bad apples from the religion, like for example, Franco Mulekel and uh, people like that, they are taken out and then uh, used to broad brush the Christian community, the pastors, the fathers. Well, there are bad apples in every religion and I leave to that. But this is the legacy of Christianity, uh, social service, charity and social action. That is what actually distinguishes Christianity from some of the major worldviews. Tarur goes on, he says, the now eminent theologian Cyril Des Brisley, then in his 20s, took my class through an epistemological argument for the existence of God, which certainly impressed my 14 year old imagination at, an, at a time when I was beginning to flirt with the idea of atheism. Now, if you're a rationalist, you need to pay attention to what he says next. When you discover rationality, the idea of religion does not seem so appealing until you discover the limits of rationalism in a world whose wonders surpass the explanations of reason.
but in between I benefited from a rational structured philosophical argument from this Jesuit priest who lectured teenagers on why God existed citing Kant and Thomas Aquinas in the process. A quick comment here. Christianity puts very high value probably more than any religion on rational enterprise. It has a legacy of Aquinas, of Kant and several other philosophers and thinkers and it is on their shoulders that Christianity's intellectual heritage stands. Now uh, recently if you just look at uh, people like Esther Dhanraj or uh, Mary Suresh Ayer, Maya Ram and several of these YouTube channels they're all peddling lies about Christianity and I, I, I say this with all due respect that when they say that you know, Christianity does not encourage questioning it does not encourage doubt that is entirely false because right from the start Christianity has placed a strong emphasis on reasoning and argumentation and it is a, it is a faith that is strongly rooted in logic, in reason and in good historical evidence. He goes on, I remember playing during the recess in our wonderful big field with some of the outstanding Anglo-Indian students of the school who consistently excelled at hockey in particular and won every possible song and music competition. My debate and speech teacher at St. Xavier's who also directed the high school's annual play was another sparkingly gifted exemplar of the cultural strengths of the Christian community. Now, uh, you know, this is not something that we uh, want to brag about, but I remember when I, when I was in school, uh, one, one, one English teacher once told me that why is it that from your community every year we, I see students and it's, it's always from your community, you know, that kids come and they bag the singing competition and several cultural competitions in the festivals. We see a lot of competition from Christian students. The reason is this, because Christianity heavily invests on the younger generation. It invests in children. Jesus said, let the little children come to me and from then on particularly in what's called the Sunday school in these weekly gatherings we uh, the church heavily invest on the overall development of children and that is uh, and Tharoor actually stating that is a strong testimony of what he, what he calls the cultural strengths of Christianity. Now Tharoor continues to make this comment about the rational enterprise of Christianity he says it was particularly striking to me that in our interactions with these Christian teachers, we were absolutely free to express our beliefs and views. Elsewhere you learn to answer the questions. The teachers I was privileged to have taught me to question the answers and later I went on to question the questions too. This is again a fact about Christianity. Again, I'm not saying about every Christian that you meet all along will be, you know, will be encouraged or, you know, they'll be um, uh, intellectually grounded. But Christianity as a whole, right from the start, has an intellectual legacy. And if you just go to that man who came to India, who, who as per tradition brought the message to our country was a disciple named Thomas. And Thomas was famously known for doubting the resurrection of Jesus. And Jesus appeared to him and he answered his question, he answered his doubt. And that's where Christianity actually begins. And even today for the, all those people who are uh, spreading a propaganda against Christianity that it's a blind belief and the, you know you are lured into this, there is no scope for questioning, there's no scope for doubt, you're wrong. Because as the rule writes, it is a it is a legacy that encourages questions. It encourages you to question the answers. It also encourages you to question the questions. Let's read further. He says, thanks to them, at an impressionable age, I was given an education that combined a well-rounded tutelage uh, with, with, with a pan-Indian outlook that made me deeply appreciative of eclectic social interests, the importance of a questioning spirit, which we have discussed, and above all, humanitarian regard for the well-being of others humanitarian regard for the well-being of others uh, we're living at a time when christianity is largely put on the radar today in india uh, with an allegation that basically we do all of these charity and social work in order to lure people to christianity 
first things first there is no nothing wrong about converting people we will sh continue to fulfill what is called the great commission we will share the gospel and there is nothing wrong with that in a country in a democratic country where free speech is allowed we are allowed to discuss ideas and we will do that uh, firstly there is a problem there because you know these uh, people who are pushing the propaganda are actually pushing it in a way that in fact doing conversions or sharing the gospel itself is a crime it is not now secondly the humanitarian aspect of christianity or the social work the social action charity is not something that we do to loop your people that is something that is grounded in the christian faith that it is out of that faith that this actually flows out there are prison ministries there are ministries that caters to the lowest rung of the society to the diseased uh, you know just consider the uh, work of Graham Staines and his uh, sons who were burnt uh, to death in Orissa he was working with the lepers and you think that he was doing that to just bring those people in the fold and make some money you're absolutely wrong the humanitarian regard for the well-being of others is something that is intertwined and it is well very much grounded in the Christian idea of man love God and love thy neighbor as yourself now Tarur actually concludes this article by uh, addressing the Christians out there he says the next time a Hindu Tawadi tries to turn Christian into a term of abuse I urge my fellow citizens of that faith to wear the badge with pride there is much that millions of Indians should remain grateful to Christians for there is much that millions of Indians should remain grateful to the Christians for well that is very kind of Mr. Tarur but as Christians in modern day India we are not asking for much we are not even asking for gratitude we are only asking for our constitutional rights and among that it is a right and freedom to practice and propagate your faith and above all your loyalty should not be questioned we are Indians and we are Christians and there is no contradiction in these two terms.